thanks everybody for coming. This is a question and answer session with Michael, so we don't have a preset uh, subjects. Although I do have some questions of my own if you want me to get started, if you don't want to. But if you have any questions and want to start, uh, does anybody want to jump in? All right, I'll ask Michael some questions to get started. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was you talk a lot about warrior societies. Was there such thing as a woman's societies or so women social groups? The women's societies and or also the warrior societies, is that what you said? Women's societies or women's social groups. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, they existed for sure, you know, and some tribes like the Cheyenne had the women's sewing guild, the quill workers guild. And there were, you know, there were always women's social groups, but not to the extent of the men, of course, because the men were the one that had the more spare time to, to spend doing that sort of stuff, you know. Um, but, you know, and that's why in most and almost all indigenous cultures around the world, the, the women do the work and women raise the babies and make the clothes and cook the food and make the food and skin the animals. And the men generally do all the religious stuff almost and all the social stuff almost. And, uh, you know, the women partake in some of that stuff to limited degrees and, you know, every now and then there's more so. And, you know, of course, with everything you say about this, there's every true fact you say about Indians, you can contradict it with 10 other, 10 other things. So, so just like, uh, you know, what I just said about the limited amount of women doing religious stuff, well, with the black feet as an example, you know, they have these uh, really powerful you know, a lot of their religion is built on these various medicine bundles that they have. And a lot of those have a, the women play a key part in, uh, in those ceremonies. And in other, other tribes, you know, the, the women are there, but they don't have like hands on. And uh, as an example, like the Cheyenne, one of their, you know, greatest, uh, Southern Cheyenne, their, you know, greatest, most religious items, say the, the equivalent, like the Ark of the Covenant of some, or something is, uh, you know, they're sacred four arrows. And they would only open those arrow bundles up on the, in dire need of, of the great spirit or, you know, success in battle or, you know, anything where they really needed the creator's help. And so when they did that, the whole tribe or however many people were present would gather together and the men and the, and the boys would all be gathered around in the giant conglomerate circle, you know, uh, around the medicine bundle and the holy man that was going to open it and all the women would be in a circle around them but on the, but on the the word from the holy man that was going to open the bundle all the women had to turn their back and face the other direction they couldn't look upon those medicine arrows um, so they were still there they were still there in spirit they were still there in body they just couldn't look upon them uh, because they believed that the women's power being about creative energy and positive energy and all that stuff might soak or suck some of the power away from those arrows. Whereas the men's energy was all about what those arrows were about, you know, so. How's that? That was great. Okay. <laughs> Did that lead to any questions? Any, any of you guys want to ask a question? You jump in at any time, raise your hand and and uh, I'd be happy to turn the mic over to you for a minute. If you don't have any, I'll go with the next set of questions I have. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the quill, quill work colors. So what were the primary colors they used when they were just doing quill work? And what sources did they use to get those colors? Well, of course, the natural color is white. There's some people today that say they never used white, but that's people that haven't used it. I looked at lots and lots of original quill work because there's tons of white quills, natural colored quills, and a lot of original quill work. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, the main colors, of course, were yellow. You see tons of yellow and wolf moss, which is that, you know, really bright green lichen looking moss that grows up in the mountains on pine trees. I'm sure everybody in that area is familiar with that moss. That makes a really vibrant, bright yellow. Uh, you have to you have to boil the quills. All the quill work, all the quills, the whatever you use to dye them with, it has to be in like a liquid form. It's not like leather that you like this that you can rub a blue pigment on it and it'll turn it blue. 
Uh, it has to be because of the, you know, quills are like plastic. And so their cells are so tight and small, they won't absorb a dye unless you boil it into it, basically. Um, you know, there are a lot of uh, introduced pigments real early on, like even uh, some of the stuff collected by Lewis and Clark when it was tested, you know, in the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years or whatever. Um, were proven to have a lot of commercial dyes in it already, and that was 1805, 1806. So real early on, and then people like different colors. They're like everybody else. You give them a new color access, well, they really like that, you know. A lot of the purple quill work you see today was actually blue originally. Um, they may have made a purple, but I think it was all blue because I've had quill work that was done for me 45 years ago that's that was dark blue when I got it, and it's as purple as purple can be now. And laundry bluing, you know, uh, Prussian blue powder pigments that you could get at Trading Post. You know, a lot of that stuff came in little cakes, you know, just little small cakes of it, basically. And it was like a dried pigment, and you had to mix it with water and then boil it and then mix that, you know, then put your quills in there and boil it in with that. So, you know, bright red, you know, Indians had very little access to that before you know, before trade came along and Chinese vermilion was of course a huge hit. And, uh, you know, I've talked about before how that's actually a mercury based paint. And so you get mercury poisoning by rubbing it on your body. Of course, the stuff I use is the same color, but it's not, uh, it's not mercury based. And uh, it can be like a flame orange red. I mean, like so incredibly bright. I've got some stuff here with it, but I might kick around that. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's very artificial looking, but the natives loved it. And, you know, that's another one of the things you hear about when people go, well, it had mercury in it. So it was kind of an, an evil plot to try to get rid of Indians by giving them mercury poisoning. But the Chinese that manufactured it and shipped it all the way across the ocean, all the traders that handled it were, you know, elbow deep in it, so to speak, were breathing the dust, which is part of the worst part of it. You breathe the fine dust, it's a really super fine powder. Uh, not, nobody knew that mercury was bad for you, I think, until like 1960s or so, you know. So a lot of people, I'm sure my age, and, you know, we, we played with it. We'd break a thermometer and play with mercury. Well, mercury is not good for your, your central nervous system and, and a lot of other stuff. So, yeah. Um, but that's how the main colors were. And, you know, one jump and leap from there is the beads. And, of course, the first beads available were what people call pony beads today. That's not an original term. I've never ever seen that used in any ledger or any trading post manifest or inventory. It's all, they're always listed as pound beads. And that's the larger size beads. And originally they usually came just in white, black, and that you know kind of medium light blue, medium blue color that people today call Bodmer blue. Because Carl Bodmer, Bodmer painted it. But, but again, that's not an original term whatsoever. Uh, they had very limited access to uh, maroons some reds, some greasier, more of a pumpkin yellow, they call it today. Uh, but there wasn't, and even some pinks. But, you know, during the main fur trade area, the, the main colors were that, the white, the black, the, that blue color, and dark blue as well, co cobalt blue. And even early on, seed beads, and they did call them seed beads originally too, and, and you see that in Trading Post inventories listed as seed beads. They were available, but like a super limited, basis until you know you get into the 1850s and 60s and then definitely 60s and 70s is when they were getting tons and tons of seed beads and a huge variety of colors and you know a lot of people of course switched right over to that there was a period there in the 70s or so 1870s where quill work went a little bit out of fashion it was considered kind of old-fashioned and uh, you still might find older people wearing it and you still see it on a lot of you know, leader shirts and stuff, a lot of quill work, but you know, some of the shirts that had made for a decade or more also. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, beads took over the new age kind of thing. And this is one of my own theories. And like I said, then you've heard my talks, I always tell you when I'm just guessing or it's my theory, but then you see a real a resurgence of quill work in the very late 1880s and the 1890s. And I think that's because, and then it kind of went away in the 1900s. And that's because I think that's when Indian people were really poor because they were just been on the reservation for a decade or less or so. And they were no longer had all the trade items like buffalo hides and all the hides that they'd bring in to buy beads. 
And I think they were reverting back to what they had readily available that was free, which are porcupine quills. So, guessing. <laughs> Next. <laughs> So was there a distinction of, was there the different tribes like different colors or did you see, or they pretty much use all the colors? The different tribes like different colors. I didn't get any of that, sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? I'm trying, yeah. Did the different tribes like different colors? Oh, yes, of course, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. No, different that tribes definitely like different colors and you know, if you were the, the head of the trading post or the guy, the buyer, you know, when you went to the big, big, uh, you know, trade meetings in Leipzig, Germany, annual meetings where all the buyers and sellers got together and ordered all this stuff or, you know, you didn't have to go there. You could put the order in at your trading post. But, yeah, you had to know what the people you were dealing with liked. And so, you know, the crow, as an example, they loved a lot of pastel colors. They loved light, light pink, light blue, light yellow, you know. They loved all those colors. Uh, the Lakota liked a white background and they had kind of a medium, very kind of specific medium light blue that they liked on the background of their beadwork. Um, you know, so definitely there were, there were different tribal preferences on the, on the beads. And you know, the, the Central and Northern Plains had a lot better access to more quantities and colors of beads than the Southern tribes did. And again, my guessing, my theory is that's why you don't see as much beadwork on those tribes. You really don't see gigantic panels of, you know, big beaded strip built, you know, like these quilt strips on here on, um, on their stuff. All their stuff is like outlines, half inch wide outlines of stuff around it, you know. And again, exceptions to everything, but that seems to be the norm. <laughs> Next. <laughs> what else? Okay, Michael, I got a question from the audience. How long <laughs> did the how long did the did the men and women typically live? What was their life span? Oh, uh, okay, gotcha. Uh, pre horse culture. It wasn't near as long. I mean, basically when the people were Stone Age people, they lived like a Stone Age lifestyle, which, you know, isn't an insult, it's just who you, who you were. Everything you had made was made with bone and stone and wood, and you didn't have access to all the trade goods. You didn't have horses that allows you to take your sick, your injured, your invalid, your elderly with you. So, you know, that kind of made the lifespan a little bit shorter. You know, I've heard, I've heard 36 is an average, but you know, it's hard to tell because, you know, there's, you'll def, there's still evidence that there were people living a lot older than that. But, um, but then once horses came around, you know, the lifespan jumped quite a bit because of those reasons you were able to carry people with you. But at the same time, once horses were introduced and guns were introduced and trades were inter trade goods were introduced, you know, the competition for land and all that and the buffalo and the horses instigated a lot more warfare. So there were a lot more young men dying than, than there were before. So that actually kind of leveled that out that brought your, you know, your average lifespan down some because you had so many young men that were dying in war. And you know, the guys going to war, they were like most guys going to war in every other culture. They were 17 to 25 year, years old. And you know, there's no set limit on it. There was no you know, in most all tribes, there was no test to be a warrior. There was no, you didn't do a sun dance. That's one of the biggest misconceptions. That was how you became a man. I mean, an 80 year old man would do a sun dance, you know, so that's a totally different thing. So, but yeah, the competition there for everything really created a new, a new deal. And, and something that I, uh, I try to stress a lot is, you know, once Euro-American contact was made, and all this new stuff came about, every decade was like an incredible new thing to people. And that's like people in general, but you know, native people before that, change was really slow. It would, it would take you know, centuries sometimes to, for change to happen. And all of a sudden, just every, you know, every few years, every five years, every eight, 12 years, there was some you know, catastrophic sometimes or just you know, monumental change brought upon them that they had to deal with. And a lot of times they had a hard time, you know, dealing with that. Was, and, and I use it, it's like if aliens came down today and 
told us all a bunch of stuff. A lot of people have a hard time dealing with that and uh, and accepting it and understanding it. And that's how I think Indian people were too. They That's how they viewed that as well. And, um, you know, as long as I keep saying Indian, that's another thing I'll, I'll mention is, you know, yeah, the modern term is all kinds of First Nations, indigenous people, you know, Native Americans. But if, if you're around Indian people, you will never hear those words unless there's a non-Indian person there. Other than that, it's Indian, Indian, everything's Indian, Indian headdress, Indian regalia, what kind of Indian you are, da 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 da. Uh, first time then a group of white people come in, and it all changes, everything's Native American, Native American, until those first people leave again. So, because I've had some people go, oh my gosh, I was really offended. He kept using the word Indian. Well, first of all, don't come to my talks if you're going to be easily offended, obviously, because. Uh, I'm going to give you, it's always going to be my version. I always admit that. Anybody that talks to you, that's their version, no matter how much they've studied it, no matter how many books and diaries and journals and manuscripts and hands-on stuff they've done with it and played with it and practiced it. And, uh, it's still going to be your version. So, you know, I admit that it, this is all my version of it, but, you know, it's, it's, an, it's more or less an educated guess. And like I say, you can contradict everything I say with, with something else, but, you know, I try to look at the, the what was the norm, you know, what, when, and especially in a lecture, when I'm on, I'm just like one of these talks now, I only got like so many minutes to try to get across a really complex point a lot of times that we could take any one of these things and break it down and talk to it for a long time about it. But, you know, I just try to tell you, okay, this was kind of like the normal between a whole bunch of different tribes and they would all have different ways of looking at it, but this is how most of them looked at it. Most of them did things. Because I'll get that from people all the time. Well, there is an exception you didn't mention. Well, of course, I, don't, I can't sit here and mention every single exception to all the stuff that we're going to be talking about in, in the limited time we do. There you go. Next. OK, we have a question. Your favorite question from the audience is, what tribe are you part of? Uh, I'm not sure. I was born in Florida, and I'm a Seminole. I'm part Seminole. And so while we, while we got a chance, can you tell us what, what tribe you're representing today, what clothes you're wearing, and tell us a little bit about that? What tribe's what? What clothes are you wearing today, and what tribe is that? Oh, okay. Like? Yeah, okay. Uh, well, first, I'll back up just a second, and because... At a lot of times in a program, I'll get the, uh, the, the the question when people ask me, you know, what tribe are you, what tribe are you from? Uh, and then I'll tell them and they go, well, why are you telling us about Plains Indians? You know, especially if they're trying to be a little bit combative or looking for something that they can pick on you or something. Uh, it's because there's so much to know about Plains Indians. There's this much about the, the, the traditional Seminole culture that we know about today. The first contact they had were with the Spanish. And as you know, I'm not bitter about anything. I'm not out there, but, but the truth is the Spanish were brutal. They never looked at any indigenous native people anywhere in the world and thought, wow, that's a fascinating culture. These are really neat people. We need to study them, collect pieces of their clothing, their weapons, their tools, and we'll send them back to Spain and we'll put them in a museum and we'll record all this data about them. They never did that because they didn't care. They just wanted gold and riches and whatever else they could loot and pillage from, from native people. So, and then for, you know, that, that stayed true for a long time, you know, and it wasn't until, you know, the 1830s and, and around there roughly, and it was mainly through Europeans and not Americans that much, because America was growing so much that, you know, we were like looking at the future, the future we're building, and that's all great. And they were, you know, we got to, you know, we got to build, and then later Manifest Destiny came, that whole theory, and it was all about that. So, but the Europeans that came over here and visited and, and saw Native Americans, you know, they were looking at it with a different POV because they had, they were coming really from a more historical sense since a lot of their countries were hundreds and hundreds of years old, see? So, you know, they looked at stuff a whole lot differently. So they started collecting all these material culture items, clothing, weapons, all that stuff, and writing down tons of information about it. And, and there's so much recorded about Plains Indians. You just, you know, it's phenomenal and, and mind blowing. And then a, then, a, then a back you'll get off of that from people when you say that is, well, well, all that was written down by the evil white man and, it, and they really distorted a lot of it to make Indian people look bad. And 
there was a lot lost in translation and stuff like that. And true stuff can be lost in translation, but usually the people that were asking the questions, the white guy or whatever, and the people answering the questions and the person that was in between the interpreter, all of them were very dedicated and determined to get the story right. They weren't. And if you don't like Indian people or anybody, it only takes a couple of sentences or a paragraph to say that. You know, you can say that really, you know, succinctly, really quickly. But, you know, these guys, they wrote thousands of pages sometimes about this stuff and never thought they were going to get a penny for it. They weren't, they weren't doing it for money. They weren't doing it to be famous. You know, a lot of their stuff, they didn't even know if it would ever be published. A lot of it wasn't published until the 20th century. So, you know, that really doesn't ring true as far as I'm concerned. And the guys that were doing it were dedicated, amateur, professional ethnologists, humanists. They were just interested in studying a very unique culture that they could clearly, plainly see the writing on the wall was doomed. You know, by the 1830s, 1840s, everybody could see this old culture was not going to last. It, it, it was, it was uh, you know, the rest of the world was moving on without Indians one way or the other. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and some people also misinterpret my frankness on that. Like, God, he must really hate Indians and the whole thing. How, how could I? I spent my whole life, literally my whole life doing this stuff and absorbed in it. And, you know, my daily life is, is every bit a, a part of it. You know, when this is over with, I go back to doing the same things. And it's always something revolving around, around this. So anyway, <laughs> what I've got on now is a, a new outfit I made this winter. Uh, it's like a classic fur trade era. A uh, crow uh, outfit with, uh, you know, you can, I'm sure you can't see the details, but crow style quill work on it. And uh, this necklace is really, you know, similar, maybe a little bit more, you know, plat uh, prairie tribes, which are, you know, like the Pawnees and the, you know, the Osage and stuff, but they're also worn on the plains as well. Um, you know, it's a grizzly claw necklace made out of the front claws only of uh, the grizzlies. So a necklace like this would take, you know, four or five, six bears to make just to make because there's only 10 claws, front claws on a grizzly bear. Uh, they're usually wrapped with otter like this one's done. Um, the crow usually didn't wear uh, chokers like you see. They usually just had like these little beaded, you know, little chokers like this. Um, they usually had like a loop necklace. I don't have that on right now. It's, had a very minimum amount of time to throw all this stuff on earlier. Um, and as you know, every tribe dressed very distinctly from each other. Uh, the regions, which are basically the Northern Plains, uh, Central Plains and Southern Plains, all those tribes dressed similar in their region and they had this regional ways that, that, that they made their patterns. And so the generic clothing from each one of those regions was relatively plain, in other words, the Blackfeet daily clothing looked pretty much similar to the Crow and the Lakota daily clothing. But you could usually tell who someone was or what tribe they belonged to just by their hairstyle. And most of them didn't wear their hair loose all the time like I got mine right now. And that's for the same reason, just like when I do my programs. I very rarely have time or anybody else to do my hair for me uh, when I'm trying to get ready. So I just do the best I can, you know, drag a brush through it or throw on a headdress and, and call it good. But your hairstyle usually was a good determinator of what tribe you were, because even out on the prairie at a distance, you had to be able to identify a group of people if you saw them, especially if you saw say 300 warriors or even 40, uh, you better know really quick who they are at a distance, because if you wait until they're 30 yards away from you and they're not your buddies, that, that's gonna be really bad for you if they outnumber you. And, you know, these young guys that were out there doing that stuff, you know, doing, doing bad stuff to other people, they would always get away with whatever they thought they could get away with. That was kind of the general rule of thumb. And frontiersmen and soldiers and everybody else learned that really soon, that uh, just that, that they could be really friendly, they could come across as very friendly, but they're sizing you up. They're sizing up your armament, they're sizing up your manpower, they're sizing up your horses. And all that stuff's running through their head the whole time. And they're weighing the, the risk of like, can we get this stuff from this, these people without losing anybody or losing very few of our, our men? So, you know, and if they came to the conclusion it was going to be too costly, 
then they go, they'd just be friendly. If they thought, hey, we can do this, well, might not work out too bad, too well for you. Uh, and what's next? <laughs> Can we just talk about something? Just a minute. We got a question. Pardon? Just a minute. Okay, that's good. I got all the time. <laughs> can, are you ready, Michael? Yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about the significance of animals, for example? Grizzlies, what was significant to them about grizzlies? The significance of animals and the symbolism behind them and stuff like that. And you said the grizzlies? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, each, you believe that, uh, first of all, that all of the animals were your relatives. They're like a distant cousin because the creator created everything. He created humans and they created all the animals. So you really saw them as, as your kin in some way or another. And every kind of animal had something unique or special about it that evolved over time that enabled it to survive and, and, and flourish in nature as well. So, you know, everything and had that and you, from observing animals all your life and from all your ancestors observing animals all their lives and passing that knowledge on, you came to conclusions based not always on science, but, you know, your interpretation of it. So, for an example, you know, grizzly bears and bears in general, it seems almost like all across North America, uh, all the different tribes, that's a big generalization, I know, uh, saw bears more as healers than anything else. Now they're great, powerful killer animals too. And they were used and revered in that aspect too. But they were also used by a lot of doctors and healers. Um, and the reason for that is, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one, due to the grizzly bears and bears have like a really dense, like, you know, thick layer of solid kind of, you know, solidified, not solidified, but, you know, fairly rigid layer of fat underneath their skin. So when you do shoot one with a, a old time bow or a musket or something, uh, that wound will close up very rapidly. There'll hardly be any external bleeding. It doesn't count if you hit it like with 308 Norma Mag or something. So. Uh, uh, so animals that were able to do that, and there's a few instances I'll mention in a second, uh, you believe that that bear had the ability to heal wounds and heal itself because it like closed that wound right up. And kingfisher birds are another that was used kind of like for bulletproof medicine uh, because, you know, way, the way that a uh, kingfisher's body is shaped, you know, when they dive into water to catch a minnow, uh, they don't make any splash whatsoever because a lot of times they're hunting minnows just right below the surface. And of course, minnows are super fast. And to stay alive, they've evolved too. If they hear a splash, they, they split. They're gone instantly. So a, a kingfisher hits the water and the water closes up right behind it. So you believed that there again, there was something going on there that if the creator and the kingfisher both agreed at that particular moment, when you were wounded, if you had a kingfisher medicine or power on you, that your wounds would close up as well. So you kind of get the whole guess of how that's going like that. Also bears were seen as he healers because uh, when they come out of hibernation in the spring, uh, they're really depleted of all the nutrients, you know, all the minerals and, and you know, vitamins that their bodies need to, to be healthy. So they go around in the spring, they eat everything. And, and of course, even grizzly bears are omnivores, like 80 percent of their diet is, is grass and uh, twigs and leaves and berries and roots and you know, grass they graze just like a, you know, a, a deer or elk would. Um, so, but as an Indian, you see that as that bear is also a healer. That bear is like a, a healer of the animal kingdom. And it's going around in the spring collecting up all the things it's gonna need to do its healing over the upcoming seasons. Like everything, lots of variations on that, a lot of things that contradict that, but that's that's kind of the gist of that. So more animals, you know, that were that had different, you know, powers. Um, you know, things like uh, swallows uh, were associated with, with cyclones and thunder and lightning sometime. 
because they'll be out ahead of a, a storm a lot of times, it's, you know, swallows and swifts and stuff like that. Otters, you know, you've probably heard me talk about programs. You know, today people see otters as, you know, these cute little, you know, Walt Disney, funny little, playful little animals. Uh, and they are, but Indian people saw them for what they were. They're the ultimate predator. I mean, nothing hardly out there is more successful than an otter. And they're a total carnivore, a total predator. And they do like to play a lot. And when they do play, they, they when they get hungry, they catch something that's just like that. And then they move on back to playing again. So uh, that's why men use otter. Uh, now, in the plateau tribes, it was different. You will see otter on some of those women. But on all the plains tribes, which is mainly what we're talking about, you won't see otter on any women at all in the 19th century. Now today that's different. Today Indian women wear eagle feathers. That, there again, that was a, a no-no back in the old days, except for very specific occasions. Any prey animal was not for women, mountain lions, wolves, otters, uh, because that's man, that's the man's world. You know, like I said earlier, we talked about women just for a brief second there. I mentioned that women's world was all about positive creative energy. That's how they they make the home, they make the babies, they make the food, they make the clothing, they, they make, they create. So as they move about in nature, they're collecting positive energy uh, wherever they go. Whereas men represent the other side of nature, the destructive, if you want to call it negative, but they didn't really look like it as negative, but it was, it was the destructive part of nature because men have to hunt for animals to, to survive and to feed their families and to clothe their families. And they every now and then have to protect their families against other humans. So, you know, that's two different worlds. And there again, that's one of the many things about this that's like worldwide for indigenous people. And if you watch uh, videos about modern day, and of course, they're getting fewer and fewer people that live like that. But, then, you know, there are people in Africa, there are people in South America that still live in these tribal groups, relatively primitive still. Um, and they'll tell you the exact same things. You'll be interviewed. You'll watch an ethnologist answer, ask a bunch of uh, South American Indians something, you know, about a bunch of men about like food, and they'll all like laugh at each other, like look at each other and laugh, and then the interpreter will, will tell, say, "Well, these guys have no, no idea about that," you know. And then they'll ask women the same things, and they'll laugh about the same thing. They're like, "Don't ask us about that. It's all men stuff. We don't know about it. We don't care about it. That's what the men do. We do what we do. They do what they do." And there's tons and tons and tons of that carryover. Um, uh, between all these different cultures. And a really good one on that, before I forget it, is, um, uh, you know, it, uh, even a small group of Indians, you know, three, four, five hundred Indians total, everybody, men, women, and child, you know, they may have a few thousand head of horses. You know, and a large group of Indians have thousands and thousands of horses, tens of thousands of them, you know, out there roaming around their villages on the prairies grazing. And a lot of people by then asked them the question, uh, how do you tell the difference between all your horses? And Indians were always like, they'd like look at each other again, like these guys are, you know, they don't get it, but they'd be trying to be polite and they go, because they all look different. Every single horse does look different. And I'm sure there's a lot of horsemen listening to me talk right now. They all do look different. Every sorrel looks different from the next sorrel horse. I don't care if it is a sorrel horse. There's something on that horse somewhere that makes it different from all the others. And then five years ago or whatever, I was watching a video about in Mongolia and these Mongolians that still are nomadic herdsmen and they have, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of horsemen and they were in the guy's yurt and the, there are these you know, British ethnologists in there, anthropologists in there talking to them. And they asked these guys the same question. They said, man, how do you guys tell the difference between all your horses? And all the, the three or four men that were in there, they looked at each other, you know, like with a kind of like a little smile, but they wanted to be polite. So they didn't come back, you idiot, da, da, da. And they were right. And they like looked at each other like, and then they looked right at the guy in the camera and they said, because they all look different, you know? So there's a, that's just a great example. I like to bring up about, you know, how these things carry over in so many cultures, all this same stuff does. So like I say, a lot of different animals had a lot of different qualities about them. Um, you know, definitely grizzly bears were also seen like as ferocious and powerful. Um, but if you had a dream or a vision, which you believe was the creator's way of uh, connecting and contacting with you and giving you your medicine or your spiritual power, um, you know, if, if it was a butterfly, you didn't look upon that as a bad thing. Any, anything that the creator gave to you, 
it's going to be your helper in life was considered a really powerful and, and great thing. And things like butterflies, um, you'll see painted on a horse even. Uh, and you'll even, I'm even seeing them on really powerful uh, Lakota Warrior Society headdresses. There's a real famous one in the museum in Cody there. And down the back of it, it has alternating big butterflies and, and the sun moon design, butterfly, sun, moon, butterfly, sun, moon, and hail and lightning. So that shows all those powerful things on there on one headdress. And the thing about the butterfly is, and you go butterfly, why would a warrior, what's, what's the deal about a butterfly? And I bring up always, it's the old Muhammad Ali thing, move like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Because a butterfly flies like this, that's almost impossible to hit with an arrow or a gun. And that's the way you need to be in battle. If you ride straight into battle like this and you move constantly in a straight line, you're gonna get shot. So you know, being able to move like a butterfly uh, is a very powerful thing. And so that went another step with a lot of this stuff. And you gotta remember that they understood that all this spiritual power only worked 10 or 20% of the time. You know, there's no real figure, but you know, they knew it didn't always work. And it didn't work more than it did work. So, but they truly believed that in a battle, you could still be running in a straight line on your horse. But what the enemy saw was this. They didn't see this. They saw like that because that power came upon you. Um, and so there are a lot of things like that, you know, and uh, another one that's is, it's still nature, it's not an animal. But every now and then I paint on my horse just to throw people off and make them ask the question. I've done it in the, at the, 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 the you know, the Pinedale uh, parades, which I'm very sorry I missed all that this year, but I'm glad we're able to connect like this. Um, but I'll paint a, a rainbow and it like goes up his, his front leg up on his, just cause he's got white there on my horse and up on his neck and all the way up on his neck. And so, you know, today people are like rainbow. Wow, I wonder, wonder what message he's trying to send us. Okay, so here's the deal with the rainbow. Rainbow is a powerful war device because you can never catch the rainbow, right? No matter how close you get to it, it's always going away from you. And that's what you want your enemy to do. If you could scare your enemy away, intimidate your enemy and not have to fight them, perfect. You were victorious and you didn't have to risk your life. They didn't like to die. They wanted to go to a lot of Buffalo feasts. They want to have lots of wives, have lots of parties, have lots of cool stuff live as long as possible. But by painting the rainbow on your horse or even on your body somewhere, you believe that if it all worked, that would make your enemy instantly just flee. They're so afraid of you and you wouldn't be able to catch them just like the rainbow, no matter how, you know, how far you went forward to try to get them, that always be running away from you. That's how you win. That's the very best way to win. So, and you may have heard me talk about like this, those big war clubs have the three knife blades that stick out of them, you know, they anywhere from this long to three feet long. Uh, that's a great intimidation weapon. You know, and, I, and if you're on a crazy looking horse and you look crazy, and the main thing in a fight like that is you've got to let it look like you don't care about your own safety, much less their safety. Uh, if you look like you're really concerned about getting hurt, well, you're probably, you might not win that, that particular conflict. So if you were out there posturing and gesturing on this fierce looking horse that had been in battle many times and had been successful many times as well, and his testosterone was shot, shooting through the roof too, a lot of people will just flee from that. They'll go, I ain't got, I don't feel like taking that dude on today. Then of course, there's always going to be the one or two that, are, that want to. And so those are the ones you're going to have to deal with by putting that front up there. So some warriors would be like that. Some warriors wouldn't. Some were more reticent. Some would be like, okay, I'm a warrior. I'm out here to fight the enemy, but man, I'm not going to be too flashy about it. Uh, I'm not going to like, you know, threaten them and try to egg them on, to, you know, and maybe, uh, you know, step over my bounds and my capabilities and stuff. And one thing back on the horse again is, you know, horses are just like, like people and, and like an athlete or, or, any, or any type of warrior or anything. You know, every time they're victorious, that imprints upon them. Um, and when you get ready to do something again like that, the horses can feel it. And again, I know there's so many horse people out there that, that know this, especially if people have done competition stuff or either just punching cows and going after cows and stuff. Your horse knows, ah, we're going to do that now. And they feel it. You can feel them. They're getting ready, you know. And, and so you can feel that energy coming up from their hooves working all the way up to their body. 
And so, you know, when you're on a war horse and he's been in war and battles before and buffalo hunts and smelled blood and seen all that stuff, that man, that it prints on them and that that hits their their inner psyche very hard and very heavy and and uh, they're fired up and they're ready to go as they should be if you're going to go into battle. And they were always looking at each other's horses. And you read that over and over in original Indian accounts. And there's so many of those original accounts out there if you start digging around for them. And of course, some real famous ones are like Plenty Coup, Two Leggings, Life of George Bent. There's many, many, many others. Okay, White Bull, there's many, many others. Uh, but they talk about that they were like you know, checking a group of people out, like spying on them or whatever, or even approaching them in battle or just in, in, you know, confrontation of any type or, you know, they're always looking at the horses first because that's the most important thing. It's just like a military commander today. You see a group of enemy, you're going to look first. What's the thing that's going to hurt us the most? If they've got armor like tanks, well, you're going to look at that first. If they don't have any tanks, but they got like, you know, APCs or, you know, anything that's got heavy armament on it or heavy cannon or heavy machine guns, that's the stuff you want to go after first. That's the stuff you want to take out first. And so they, the Indians were the same. They, they could see from a half a mile away the good horses. They were masters at horse flesh. And they could see the loser lame horses, the, the nags, the sway bags, the old ones, the worn out ones, the blind in one eye, the limping ones. And they could see the ones that weren't like that whatsoever, you know. And of course, usually the men weren't be, unless they didn't have many horses, they would be leading their very best horses, especially if they were going to a battle, and they'd be riding a secondary mount. You know, that was still probably a pretty decent horse. But you got to remember, they didn't all have killer, great, you know, great killer war horses. And if they did, that horse could disappear overnight, be killed or die in so many different ways that, like I said, you weren't guaranteed to always have the best horse in the whole wide world because you might have one for a month or 10 years, but you know, I don't think they had many horses that were like 33, 35 years old. You know. And of course, they would be retiring a horse like that anyway from war. And like I said, they would always swoop in on those guys that were on the lame horses first or the, you know, the lower grade horses first uh, because they knew those were going to be easy kills. And most of their horses were like horses today. You know, five or something percent of them were total losers, calls, you know, whatever. They would, you know, bonehead, hammerhead, knuckleheads, you know. Uh, you know, these aren't scientific numbers, but, you know, 80-something percent of them were, were decent saddle horses. They, they'd do what you wanted them to do. They'd saddle up nice. They could ride them. Anybody could ride them. They'd pull stuff around for you and do their chores, but they weren't, like, high-performance horses. And only five to seven-something percent were high-performance horses. That's just like today. You can't just take a regular horse and turn it into a champion anything, whether that's rodeoing or showing or racing or chasing buffalo or other people on them. You know, you, you've got to start with the bloodline. And Indian people knew that. The Indian men breeding horses understood that. And they, they you know, they, they gelded most all their males. They understood. And because they, they learned that from the Spanish and the Mexicans. Yeah, they geld all the ones that they didn't think were going to be the quality. And the men that were able to get a good horse line going, just like today, they did very well by that, by 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 pay by charging people to to uh, breed their mares for them. But today, everybody uses the word trade or you're gifted. Like they would give the guy a gift, and he would do something for him. It was payment. There's no. It, it sounds so cool and quaint to call it a gift, but it wasn't a gift. They would not breed their stud with your mare without that really nice gift of five buffalo robes or a rifle or whatever the particular, you know, the fee might be for that particular animal. So they understood all that. And uh, like I say, they didn't know they weren't all riding on killer horses. And that's the truth. And some of them went into battle on horses that weren't any gun, even gun broke. And there's Indian accounts that talk just about that, that say, I never had enough ammunition to, you know, because it was very expensive. And ammunition was the same price for everybody back then. Alcohol, guns, and ammunition you know, the three things that a lot of the men in the old West wanted, no matter what race you were, were expensive for everybody. So, um, you know, a lot of them just didn't have tons of ammunition enough to be able to practice a lot. So a lot of them weren't great shots and some of their horses weren't even all that gun broke. And so, um, you know, and a lot of the soldiers weren't even great shots because during the Indian wars, especially the ones 
following the Civil War, the government was so broke from the Civil War that they had very little money to supply uh, troops with enough ammunition to practice. And it was common for officers, company, and you know, regimental grade officers to pool their monies together just to buy private purchase ammunition just so their men would get to practice stuff. So if they did go into battle against Indians, uh, you know, their men would have some experience with it. And of course, a lot of those guys were recruits and immigrants from Ireland and England and Italy and all over the world that just wanted to become an American citizen. And they wanted, you know, three meals a day and a nice warm place and nice warm clothes in the winter. Um, and they're always portrayed as like Indian haters and all they wanted to do, they couldn't wait to get their chomps into an Indian to kill an Indian, to scalp an Indian. Uh, but, you know, when you read their accounts, what those soldiers read, you got to read all the, the ledgers and, and journals, trappers, traders, missionaries, soldiers, explorers, Indians, to get kind of an over idea of how all of it came together. And most of those guys, the last thing they wanted to do was go on a campaign against Indians because that's how you get killed, you know. And that's how you usually end up eating mule meat and boiled leather after you've been on the trail for six weeks looking for Indians who you'll never find usually unless they want you to find them, you know. And that's why eventually they realized that we're going to, you know, make contact with these Indians we're trying to make contact with. You've got to hit them in the winter uh, when the cavalry horses by regulation and law had to be fit for duty every day of the year. And they were. Uh, and Indian horses weren't in the winter. And they knew Indians were usually holed up in one spot in the winter. You didn't move around in the winter so that much. So it was relatively easy to find them. In the summer, it could be really hard to locate them or just catch up with them. And... Um, so that's all, all that, but everything revolved about around the horses. Once you got on horses to go into battle, because if you're on a nag horse, you're gonna you're gonna get killed, you know. And their horses were like, you know, like my horse I used to have. You know, they would they would t-bone you and knock you and your horse over so hard, and they would run parallel to another horse, and I could hit my horse with just my knee on the same hit, hit, hit body slam another horse just like that, and you could knock the rider off knock the horse, other horse right over, that run right over people, that run right over horses. I've heard people say, well, horses, you fall off and the horses just don't move and they'll jump over you. They'll never, <laughs> if you train them to run over people on purpose and they do it one time and you tell them what a good boy he was for doing it, they're a horse. They'll go, ah, he likes me to run over people. Okay, next time he wants me to do it, I'll be right on it. And they'll run right over you in a heartbeat. I've done it. <laughs> so, uh, but like I say, the, the ones that were fierce were fierce, the horses, you know, and um, they were killers. They're total killers. And, you know, the war horses uh, next, uh, uh, you know, they were marked with split ears. And so were the main buffalo runners. They'd mark them by splitting their ears. Uh, they'd sometimes notch the side of their ear. You'll see that, too, out of the side of their ears, like a big notch taken out of it. Um, I've even seen like holes plugged through their ears about the size of your finger through the through the ear. And I've never read that met, met a war horse, but I'm sure, pretty sure it probably did because it goes along with the same way of marking their ears to, to designate those things. Um, and, uh, you know, you may have heard me talk about the Scythians who was, you know, ancient, uh, you know, horseback culture. They are really the first people that rode horses and they fought the ancient Greeks and we've found some of their preserved horses, their war horses, and their ears were notched all the way down where they cut notches out of their ears all the way down so their ears were serrated. And I think, you know, we don't know, but I think that they were doing the exact same thing there. That was how they were marking like an elite horse, so like that. And, uh, and I know a lot of you heard me tell the story, but the first ear is really easy to do. You just go up and grab the ear and turn a knife, really sharp knife upside down, grab the ear, just punch it right through it. But the, the second ear is a little bit more of a challenge. So. Next. <laughs> any, any questions? Okay, Michael. Yes, sir. How big, how big were the tribes? And, okay, were, they pure, and were they purely hunter gatherers before so, they contact? So, of course, that varied over time a lot. Uh, of course, epidemics uh, inf uh, affected that a lot. Though most tribes would come back relatively quick, but you know, 
not that quick. Uh, but, you know, and you hear all kinds of numbers. But And again, we're just talking about the plains, not North America, not South America, where most Native Americans live, by the way. Uh, uh, but, you know, 225,000 or so, I think is a realistic number to say all the Plains tribes from Southern Alberta to Central Texas, east of the Rocky Mountains, out onto the Central Plains of, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, uh, Oklahoma, Kansas, et cetera. Um, there are only roughly 30 some tribes, 30, 32 tribes. You know, some of them were very small, like the smallest was the Sarsi. They lived in Canada and they were allies with the, with the Blackfeet. They were about the only allies that the Blackfeet had because there were only a thousand of them, which means they only had about 200 or so warriors. So the Blackfeet, they weren't any threat at all. So the Blackfeet were like, sure, you can be our friend and we'll protect you like that little buddy. Uh, but a lot of the tribes we even hear about a lot, like say the Crow and the Cheyenne, they were still like five, six, 7,000 people only. And, and roughly a fifth of your people are gonna be warriors as a, as a rule of thumb. And there are a few things, the rules of thumbs that you read back then amongst traders and missionaries and soldiers and other Indians. In other words, people that needed to know how many Indians were in a village when they saw a village. So roughly there were 10 Indians in every teepee. That's a good estimate, you know, some more, some less, but if you counted 100 TPs, 1,000 Indians, pretty easy to do the math. So they all use that little formula. And usually a fifth of them, like I say, are gonna be warriors. So. Now, every man considered himself a warrior, you know, no matter if he hadn't been to war in 35, 40 years, he was still a warrior, though he knew he wasn't a 19 year old warrior still. And those gray haired warriors would still always protect their families, they would always give their life, just like any of us uh, grandpas and older guys would do today for our families. But again, we know we're not the guys we were when we were 19, 23 years old. Um, so they would still do all that stuff. They didn't go actively to war um, to that. But then the very biggest tribes, the biggest tribe of all were the Comanche in the South. And that's why you always hear how dominant they were. They were dominant because there were so many of them. And always the most warlike tribes just like all throughout history of the world, the most warlike people are always the most dominant people, the ones that can be warlike, you know. Uh, if you have a lot of people, you can be in a lot of technology, you have the ability to be warlike. So the Comanche were very warlike. They dominated all over the Southern Plains because there were roughly 25,000 Comanches, men, men, women, and, men, women, and child, children. Uh, when you move up towards the Central Plains and into, you know, the, that area, well, it's going to be the Lakota for sure that dominate. And those estimates range from 15 to 20,000 people also. I mean, so fewer than the, than the Comanche. And then in the Northern Plains and in the Northwestern Plains, it was the Blackfeet who were about the same number as the Lakota. Uh, tribes like the Crow again, who only had, you know, five to 7,000 people total and not that many warriors. Um, they also lived in what was considered some of the richest and best country there was, which is up and down the Yellowstone River Valley, which was called the Elk River back then. Um, and rich meant tons of game, tons of grass, tons of forage, tons of water, you know. And, um, and so since they lived there and they moved into that area and kind of took a hold of it, as time moved on into the 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, all the other tribes that were their enemies, the Blackfeet, Northern Cheyenne, you know, the, the Lakotas, the Arapahoes, all those tribes, uh, they vastly outnumbered the Crow. I mean, huge, hugely, you know, massively outnumbered the amount of Crow warriors. But the Crow were still really great warriors and they did the very best they could to hold their land. And the land that like where Little Bighorn happened, that was Crow land. And you hear all these people today talking about, oh, the Lakota, we were protecting our land. Well, the Lakota went in there and broke the treaties and nabbed that land away from the Crow because they Crow couldn't get in there and do nothing about it because there were just so many of the Lakota and their Northern Cheyenne allies. Uh, and so that's why the Crow allied up with the white soldiers right away. And there again, that's as old as mankind. If, if you're in it, your enemy's my enemy. And if you're gonna help me defeat my enemy, I can be your friend long enough to do that. And you hear all the time, especially on Facebook, which is the most garbage place in the world, to get history, especially about 
you know, native people, Indian people, most people that talk about it shouldn't. That's the, that's the number. It's the most misquoted subject in the whole world because most of it comes from novels and TV shows and movies and stuff. But, uh, you know, if they show a picture of any Indian that's a scout, has on soldier stuff, all the comments will be, traitor, traitor, he sold out his people. But they don't realize that they did it. To, that was the only way they could keep their people alive. And tons of Lakota became scouts for the army. Tons of Cheyenne did it too. Once they surrendered, their particular band surrendered, and the, the soldiers came to them and they said, oh, you got a couple of choices here, the government said. You can become a farmer or a merchant or an indigent of the state, and we're going to take away your guns and horses. Or you can still be a man, and we'll pay you to do what you know how to do the best, which is to hunt down and find stuff and take it or kill it. And most all of those men went, I'll take the latter choice. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to still be a man. I'm not going to give up uh, being a man. And let me ride my horse. Let me carry my weapons. Let me do what I know how to do. Um, and like everything, once you explain it all and get the background to it, you can sometimes convince people. But of course, like you say on Facebook, there's a lot of people you can never convince them of anything, no matter how much stuff they, uh, you know. And uh, I always think it's funny because People hammer me on there, you know, well, you know how to, you know, and I'll, and I'll, I'll say, well, just take a look at my page. All those are thousands of photographs of me doing this stuff. And then I'll say, well, look at your page. It's a picture of you mountain biking and having a picnic with your family and your baby. Well, that's all great stuff. But so I'm just saying, weigh the difference. Here's your point of view and here's my point of view. Who do you think might possibly know something about it? And I'll, there are people that know a lot more about this than I do, especially a lot of the very specific parts of it and I freely admit that and there's a lot of great guys out there and women too that that I learn stuff from all the time and and when I'm presented with something new and something to back it up man I'll drop my old way of thinking and instantly incorporate it because the last thing I want to do is keep repeating something that's stupid or something that's incorrect or just historically wrong I want to know what's right and I've been wrong many many times that's called learning that's how you learn stuff uh, and that's why I tell people there's no such thing as a stupid question. And a lot of people in the audience, they'll raise their hand. I say, this is probably a stupid question. I'll stop them all and say, there's no such thing. Being stupid is not asking a question when you do want to know something. It may be stupid is a strong word, but, you know, ask, you know, look, listen to people. If they know what they're talking about. And I say, there's so many guys out there that know this stuff. That, and the instant they say it, I, I almost instantly accept it. As the as the gospel. Next, <laughs> that question. Okay. Uh, as far as the young boys or the young children, how how young were boys when they started using bow and arrow? And did you get that part? When did they start using bows and arrows? Yeah, when, when did the kids start using bows and arrows? Oh, when did the kids? Okay. Uh, well, I can do the quick uh, kids thing, which is always interesting and fun for people and give you like the typical life of a boy in a few minutes and the typical life of a girl in a few minutes. Um, so, you know, when they were, you know, three to five years old, they pretty much all played together. The boys and girls played together. Um, Girls almost usually were clothed, but, you know, it wasn't because they were modest. They just, you know, they really, until they were taught to be that way, they didn't see nudity as something weird or perverse or anything. Um, but um, they played together and they played games like kids play. They played house, you know, they imitate, they emulated and imitated the adults. And, you know, they you know, made toys uh, and a lot of their toys were like instant made and they threw them away. Because they were nomads, they didn't, they couldn't have like a whole saddlebag full of kids' toys. And, you know, they took uh, big leaf cottonwood trees, uh, leaves, you know, which are kind of shaped like this, which is kind of like the shape of a teepee. And they would pick one of those off with the stem on it too, pull the edges together, and then take that stem and shove it through it. And it makes a perfect little teepee. And you can actually tear the top and make the smoke flaps come out onto the sides like that too. And so they'd set, you know, 10, 20, 30 of those up, whatever, and make little teepee villages out of them. Uh, they'd take just a little stick like this, cut it on both ends with a knife, 
bend those down, cut those two bend down, make legs, bend the other part up. You get it. That's like a horse. So they made little stick toys like that. You know, grandma would make you a quick little toy. Uh, girls had dolls that sometimes they would keep with them and carry around with them. So you get it. They didn't have like tons and tons of toys that they took with them all the time. Uh, so boys were given their first bow and arrow when they're about five years old, roughly, you know, and they had little blunt wooden tipped arrows. Um, they didn't have expensive, which meant they took a lot of work and time to make metal arrowheads that they had to trade for, or they could make out of, you know, any metal they got from the white guys. Um, uh, or stone points, because again, they were just, you know, too much troubled for a little kid because they were going to lose and break most all the arrows anyway. Um, and then those little boys went out and, and big little big herds of, you know, boys of five to 30 of them or whatever. And they did what any boy would do if you gave them a BB gun with a whole bunch of other little boys. And they went out and they shot every songbird they could, every prairie dog, ground squirrel they could. And, um, uh, and uh, they brought those back and they gave them to grandma usually. And they would a lot of times have, especially the older people, like a crock pot for lack of a better word, uh, stewing. And they would just throw all that stuff in it, they'd skin it. But they would throw all those different animals in it and it'd make like a gruel of this meat stew. You know, they might put other prairie, prairie turnips in it, whatever, dried choke cherries, whatever. Uh, uh, and then that was like, you know, something that was on the stove all the time that anybody, the elderly or anybody could just get some really quick if they wanted to. And like any good grandma anywhere, they would tell their little grandson, oh, what a good hunter you are. You're going to grow up to be just like your grandpa and your father you, to protect your people and supply food for your people. And the boys would be even more proud and they'd go back out and kill even, he'd kill even more game then. And so the boys would do this from five to seven or eight, nine years old. Again, there was no age thing set, specific age for all this different stuff. It's just when that group of boy got to the group of boys got to the point where they were to graduate up to the next step, they all kind of did. And then the younger group coming up, you know, took their place in that stuff. Um, but what they were learning in that five to eight year old age group, roughly, um, they thought they were just having a grand old time because it was a grand old time if you were a boy back then, you know, no responsibilities. You were totally free to do anything. Uh, the only people that could tell you yes or no or don't do something was your father or your uncles or your grandfather. And they hardly ever disciplined or told the boys not to do anything. The women, the mothers really couldn't discipline their boys at all, but they encouraged them. Everybody encouraged them to be as out there and extroverted as possible because that's how those men, those boys needed to be to become the men they needed to be to protect their people. They couldn't be shy, reticent. Oh, I'm afraid. I don't know if I should go into battle or not. Oh my gosh, there's a grizzly bear. What am I going to do? I mean, you, I've got to instantly have that in you. And so much of it is reaction and instinct when you're confronted with issues like that. You don't have time to think. You only have time to be scared. You know, your body either reacts or not, fight or flight. It's one of those, you either have it in you or you don't. And even the best man, it can break at different times. Okay, so anyway, back to what they were learning. What they were learning without even consciously focusing on it. And they didn't get a lot of tutelage either. There weren't a whole lot of men like sitting around in a group teaching these boys stuff. They just turned them loose, let them learn it. They were learning everything about animals, all the noises they make, all the different, how the different species, the different sexes, all the different times of year, what they do differently and how they, how they evade each other, how, which ones can smell the best, hear the best, see the best and all that. That's what they were learning by just doing all these games that they played. The other great thing they were learning that they weren't really focusing on was how to coordinate with a group of people for a successful hunt because hunting in a group is going to make you a lot more successful than just you going out there by yourself and they understood that and so you know the, the, the men did and uh, so the boys were learning right then and there how to hunt with a group and also right then and there the boys were already establishing the future hierarchy because it's just like in the boy scouts and the the, the cub scouts and boy scouts explorers you know uh Grade school football, junior high school football, you know, high school, college football. All the guys generally that were the leaders in all those groups are going to eventually be the leaders later on. There's nothing wrong with being a follower. Some, some people would rather be a follower. They're going to be just as great of a warrior. Some people are just going to be leaders for whatever reason, right? So that's the other thing they were leading. They're, they're, they're already establishing this guy's a leader. This is a guy that 
seems to always be really lucky or very successful. He a lot of times seems to have the answer. And when we're with him, we always have a lot of fun and, and it's successful. So that's the other thing. So then those boys graduated up to the next group, which was roughly 9, 10, 12, 13, 14 years old. And those became the horse, the horse herd guys. And they spent those, those years just dealing with horses, you know, training them, breaking them, bringing them in, moving them around, moving them for pasture, watering them, helping doctor them. And so, again, that is like a boy's dream come true. It's like growing up on a ranch where you got access to a lot of livestock and a lot of horses. Man, you just grab one, you throw a rope in its mouth, you jump on it, you run away, you play tag, hide and go seek on them. That's how I did when I was a kid. And that's probably one of the ways I got to be a halfway decent horseman. You know, you just play on the horse and of course it becomes a part of you like that. And so again, they thought they were just having the best time in the world, but they were living, learning the next most important thing after the whole animal thing. And that is to survive horses. What are they like? What's their psychic like? How do you affect them? How do you train them? How do you connect with a horse? How do you, you know, all these things. And uh, what, how do you get the most out of a horse? What, how do they feel about stuff? How do they react to stuff? Uh, what's the endurance level and all the different grades of horses. So that's what they were learning during that time when they thought they were just having a good old time just being an Indian boy. So now by the time they're 15, 16, 17, they've, they've learned all that other stuff. So now they're going to maybe be invited to go along on a war party. Uh, but they're not, they're usually they're not the very first one or two times. They're not invited as a warrior. They're invited as a war party helper. And that's a very specific job and that means that you're going to mainly follow the war party leader and you're going to you're going to have water for him you're going to have food for him you're going to build his fires you're going to take care of all the mundane things that the war party leader shouldn't have to deal with the war party leader is the combat company commander he's like the captain he's not doing adjutant work stuff he's not doing supply stuff his job is to find the enemy take him out and lose no no none of your own people or as few as possible. So he shouldn't have to worry about, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm cold, I gotta have a build a fire. And so these young guys were learning just by being around the war party leader. He very rarely turned to a group of these young war party helper guys and said stuff, you know, well, don't do this and don't do that. If you see the enemy, you gotta do like this, nah, nah, nah. They just shut their mouths and they listened and they watched what he did. And that's how they learned. All their learning processes were slow, which is great. You know, today kids, and people, people are capable of it, and kids are capable of it. But I mean, really, a, a kid, by the time they read seventh, eighth, ninth grade, there's so much information into their head that, that Indian people never, ever, ever had to go there. You had to know about nature. You had to know about the weather. You had to know about animals and, and human beings. And that was the extent of what you really had to know to be an Indian back in the old days. And that was great. So all the slow, the process, learning processes were really slow. They were done over time. Uh, if you served as a war party help, helper and did a good job of that, then maybe the next war party, you'd be invited as a warrior. You, know, you could be 15, 16, 17, or 18, but they usually weren't 13 or 14. You hear that, but you know, they were the same. Most 13 or 14 year old boys, and they're boys then, they're not ready for that. They're not ready to put into the life and death kind of situations that a, a warrior man is going to be put into the, the, the reality of it, not the, the, the parading around with feathers and all that fun part stuff of it uh, afterwards. But, you know, the, 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 the bloody gory, you know, the hard, the hard stuff about it. Uh, you know, you had to be a little bit older usually to be just ready to accept that. Um, so once they went to war, then those guys usually spent the next five, seven, eight years doing that. And they had two types of warfare. One was war parties. That's where it's a big, usually a big deal. Didn't have to be a lot of people. A lot of times it was a lot of people. Uh, you wore your warrior regalia when you went into battle. You you were looking for the enemy. You wanted to find the enemy. You wanted to kill the enemy. You wanted to take all their stuff, as, if at all possible, all their women, all their horses, all their goodies, and their all their stuff. Um, so that was one type. The other thing they did was horse raids, horse capturing raids. And those were usually very small affairs, five, 10 guys, 12 guys. You hardly ever hear of like 50 guys going on a war, war capturing raid um, because that's the easy way to get caught because you had to go deep into your enemy's country. And of course, all the tribes had very distinct boundaries between their land. Everybody knew where they were. Um, and you had to go into their country to find their horses. 
and they almost always went on foot into their enemy country. And they would generally travel only at night because if you ride horses into an enemy country, horses leave tracks that are so much easier to find, not even just their tracks, but just their dung that they leave constantly everywhere they go. So they almost always went in on foot uh, to find their enemies. Then they captured the horses and took them home. And you've, you've probably all heard me make the distinction and I correct people all the time on this because it's one of my pet peeves. I have my mission in life to keep to quit to teach people to quit saying this. And then say they talk about they stole so many horses, they were horse thieves, they stole, steal, all this. They don't they didn't steal anything, they captured them. There's a huge difference between stealing something and capturing it. And I always say break it down simple. Thieves steal, warriors capture. They they never thought of themselves as, as immoral thieves. These are immoral. Yeah, you know, I hate thieves. I hate people that think they should have something of mine or anybody else's that I've worked hard for, or that I've made, that's been in my family or part of my life, and they think they just have a right to it. That's a thief, okay? A, son, a warrior captures stuff, and then I always use the one that I think is a good one that really hammers it on home if people don't get it yet. And they'll go, well, they were still stealing those horses. And I'll say, okay, here's this. Go find a 92-year-old United States Marine Corps veteran and you tell him that that Japanese battle flag that he captured on Iwo Jima, he stole it. Oh, man, you'll have a 92-year-old fight on your hand and he'll tell you how much of a fool and idiot you are for calling him a thief. So that makes sense there, I hope, that you really see. They weren't thieves. They were warriors. They captured stuff. Huge difference. So anyway. So anyway... They would spend up until 24, 25, so roughly in there, amassing their personal wealth and their personal status in the tribe. Because to get the best wives, to marry into the best families, et cetera, you had to have at least a certain amount of war honors you know, under your belt. And you had to have at least a certain amount of horses willing to trade or give or gift or whatever uh, for your bride and to be able to support her as well. And the women wouldn't marry you just because they loved you. They married you because... Because it was life and death, of course, living out in the plains of Montana and Wyoming back then. Uh, they wouldn't marry you unless they knew that you, you could support them, that you had the means and the horses to carry them and their future children around, and you were a good hunter and a, a good provider. So, you know, it took a while to establish all of that. And one thing they did to, to establish themselves socially, besides being a leader or quasi-leader, you didn't have to be a leader, was, you know, these guys might go on a horse raid five, 10 guys or whatever. And they might catch several, you know, capture several hundred head of horses. Um, usually the first couple of days after they got those horses and they would usually go in there at night, you know, they would watch a village and back up a little bit. When they went on a raid, they would find a potential village that had a nice herd of horses. They would usually just, you know, scope them out for several days if possible. And they would figure out where the leaders were, you know, because they could see this teepee here has a lot of traffic. There's a lot of people, a lot of men going to that teepee. That's because that guy's some sort of leader. And then they could see the horses that were tied out in front of the best teepees. They knew there again, those are the finest horses. Those are the best lead. Those are the leader guys right then. So once they had it scoped out, then they would go in late at night. Um, they usually didn't like to do it with a full moon. They liked to do it with a little bit of moon, if at all possible, for some sort of light. Uh, the, the leaders of the war, the, the horse capturing raid or the most brave and boldest guys were chosen that you couldn't elect yourself to do this. There was a leader always that said, this is what's going to happen. And only those guys would go right into the village to get the very best horses because that took the most bravery and the most experience to do that. Um, the, the lesser guys, they would go out on the prairie where the horses were, were up, you know, herding and, and grazing overnight and resting overnight. And they would move into those horses slowly, gently, carefully, and slowly try to move them together, you know, move them, get them to, to cordon off the ones you wanted, move them away from the herd a little bit. Uh, there was no like hooping and hollering and a lot of thundering and galloping and low, loud noises. And then the guys, meanwhile, that went into the village, they knew that if they snuck, tried to sneak into the village, the hundreds of dogs that were in most Indian camp, that's another thing that's never showed in movies. If there's a dog, it's one dog. You know, it's the it's a prop guy's dog that they throw in the movie really quick because somebody said, didn't Indians have dogs in villages? They said, yeah, we'll get, you know, Joe's old, old blue healer down here. We'll use that as the Indian dog. They had bunches and bunches of dogs. 
and anything sneaking around out there that's you know they would they would let up a you know they would let you know that there was something going on out there so they knew the best way to go into an indian camp at night was just to pull a blanket up over your head like indian people did all the time anyway and just walk right straight into the camp just slowly carefully not not like sneaking around but just you know methodically like you normally would as a regular person go right for the where you knew that horse was you wanted and if you know the the people suspected any enemies were around and were going to be trying to capture your horses um yeah they might even sometimes even run a rope from that horse's neck or from his one of his you know hocks uh under the teepee cover and tied to your ankle or to your wrist and so you would walk up Make sure that horse wasn't spooked at all. Calm him down, breathe in his nostril, make real low noises, do all the things the horses like, you know, rub their chest, run their neck, you know, all that stuff. Uh, so the horse is really calm. Then they might gently cut that rope. And then they wouldn't start walking away with it either. You slowly take a step. You wait a few minutes, listen. Take a few more steps. Because like if you're camping out, and again, I'm, I know there's a bunch of guys that have done this, women too, you know, been packing with horses on hunting trips and stuff. When you're sleeping at night with horses and you're depending on them to get you out of there and they're nearby, you can hear even when you're sleeping, you can feel the normal movements they make when they just shuffle their feet around. But if you in your sleep or half sleep here, well, that's the noise of your horse walking away. That's not a good sign. So they knew that too. So they would, like I said, try to slowly lead the horse away from that teepee. Then once they got it on the outside of the village, they start moving with it a little bit further. And then they'd have a predetermined spot outside of the village somewhere uh, where all of them are gonna meet up together. Once they met up and they thought they were out of earshot, it was gallop and haul tail for the next day or two because they knew when that tribe woke up in the morning, they were gonna gather up whatever horses they had left and they were gonna come after you. And definitely if they caught you, they were gonna kill you. There was never, any other penalty other than death, you know? So, uh, so they tried to put as much distance between you, them themselves and their, and their enemies as they could. Uh, and during that process of running the horses pretty much, you know, they loped them and stuff. They didn't gallop the whole time, but you know, they kept moving right along uh, cause they knew there was no way to hide that trail. You know, you, you 50 to 300 horses and whatever leaves an incredible trail. So you just had to move. And the, the, the horses that weren't worth keeping would play out along the way. And they never tried to wait for them or gather them up. If the horses couldn't keep up, they just moved on and kept on moving. And they would take a colt or a foal and strangle that thing down, cut its throat. And they'd cut that meat up and throw it right on their backs and let's lash on. Again, these guys are like 17, 21 years old. They were bold. They didn't care. They were just dreaming of getting home alive and what great heroes and how wealthy they were going to be with all these horses once they got home. So anyway, they, they finally made it back home successfully for with however many horses they finally made it back home with. Then a lot of them would give them almost all of them away. And a lot of times they gave them to their female relatives and female friends. Um, and those women owned those horses. They were their personal property. Nobody could take them from them. It didn't matter if she was married, had a father, whatever. That was her horse to do whatever she so, so chose to do with for, for forever. And one of the reasons they gave away a lot of their horses, and you know, there's always the noble reason, reason behind it, um, but there's always usually a practical reason behind even be, do, being noble and doing noble stuff. And the practical reason is this, when you give somebody a really nice horse, you've probably made a friend for life. And I always tell people, it's like if I gave five people in the audience brand new Ford or Dodge four wheel truck with all the bells and whistles on it, those guys would never let anybody talk bad about me the rest of their life, probably. They go, whoa, wait a minute. He gave me a brand new truck. He's a pretty good dude. I like him. So anyway, that's how they kind of looked at that as well. That uh, it was really a great way of gaining allies. So later on in life, as you moved up in the social ladder of status, you would have a, a good support base, you know. Um, and so that's how that then once they got in there and all this time they're doing this whole warrior thing 17 to 25 roughly that age group they're constantly looking for girlfriends constantly looking for wives they're men that's what they that's what they did they, they weren't they weren't shy about it everybody knew about it women told their five six-year-old daughters i'm gonna talk about daughters next uh girls next 
uh, real early, hey, this is what men are like, you know, and they saw it too. They saw everything in front of them. There was no hiding of anything because there's no privacy in an Indian camp. But they told them what the focus of a lot of men's life was, you know, so everybody understood that and there was nothing wrong with it. And it wasn't until, you know, they got into their early mid 20s that the men usually started thinking about marriage and actually got married. Okay, now we just go back. We're going to talk about the girls. And uh, I'll probably talk about all kinds of things in between, too. That's the way I do. You, you're probably used to that by now. Is um, So now, now the girls are separated and uh, from the boys, pretty much. And from that point on, until she's married, she's probably never, ever going to be out of sight of her mother or her aunt or her grandmother or her older sisters or an older female friend of the family. They're almost always going to be supervised by women because, they're, again, they know what men are, are like. And of course, the men weren't going to molest little girls, but you know what I mean? They were just, they were taught from then on, okay, you're a girl, you're going to be a woman, and so you're going to live in a woman's world. And the fathers didn't teach the girls much, and the women didn't teach their boys much. Uh, and they all loved their kids, just like any parent do, but the men didn't have much to teach their daughters other than by example. And even that's true today. If, if you're a good man, and you're an honest man, and you've got a good heart, your daughter's going to catch up on that, catch that as she grows up. You're not, you're not going to have to hammer morals and stuff into her if she grows older. She's, she's going to grow up. She's going to see all that already. So you get it. That's how they did things. So by the time once they're five or six, now she's going to go and she's going to hang out with the women only. And so for a few years there, there was a period, five, six, seven years old, uh, just like those boys that got to play a lot with the bows and arrows. But they did play a lot. They, they, they watched grandma and mom and they maybe helped a tiny little bit, but it was mostly play and enjoy life and just, you know, be around the women, hear the women's stories, hear the women talk. But once they got seven, eight, nine, ten, there again, no this exact day, a year, whatever age, um, then they started having to start work. And so by the time they were nine or ten, they were, you know, carrying a lot of wood. They were hauling water. They were helping tan hides. They were helping do all these little things. And like any good grandma, when she thought her, her granddaughter or mother also thought that their, their granddaughter or child was old enough to maybe try some beadwork or try some quill work or whatever, or try this or try that to go here. Here's one for you to play with. Work on this, to experiment with this. And they would correct themselves, you know, do it like this, da, da, da. But, uh, so, you know, but by the time they were like 12, 13, 14, yeah, they were, they were working. They knew how to be a woman. They knew how to tan most all the hides. They knew how to butcher all the different animals. They knew what to do with kidney fat versus heart fat. They knew what you do with the liver. They knew how to blow up and dry a bladder. They knew how to dry choke cherry, you know, all that stuff. They knew how to identify all the herbs and the different plants and all that stuff. So most girls, by the time they were 15 or 16, were all married because there were usually so many more women than there were men. And the reason for that was, is they lost quite a few men in intertribal warfare. And you gotta remember that the warfare between the whites and the Indians in the plains really was only the last couple of decades of this whole lifestyle. It was basically the 1860s, 1870s. Um, there wasn't a lot of war between whites and Indians on the plains between 1810, 1830, 1840. It was all about trade and commerce then. Everybody got along, everybody was making money. Everybody liked that. They liked that the Indians were getting rich, white people were getting rich uh, off of it. So it was a mutually beneficial relationship. And it wasn't until the wagon trains came through and settlers came through, through and that caused the trouble, but I digress. We'll get back to the little Indian girls. So, so by the time they were you know, early teenagers, that's when the girls got married almost always. And then the girls almost always started having babies as soon as they were able to have babies. And you know, they were polygamous because they did lose so many men in warfare, but they lost a lot of men, probably even more, uh, just from being an Indian man, because it was a dangerous life being an Indian man back then. Because you're out in nature all the time. There were so many ways to die in nature back then, and today too, but more back then, uh, just because you were living in the elements so much, uh, that they just lost a lot of men, and the, the, there was a disproportionate amount of, of men to women. So they had to practice polygamy, and they practiced sororal polygamy, which is when you marry all the, the, the girls, or not all, but you marry the, the sisters of one particular family. Uh, so they believed that that kind of eliminated any, any jealousy. It didn't always work. 
Um, and you could only have as many wives as you could afford. They were expensive then, they're expensive now. So, um, you know, most men had two, you know, some had one, some had three or four. They were, they were really rich men, which meant they had lots and lots of horses. They had five, seven, nine, nine wives. But, you know, that's a lot of people to take care of. That's a lot of people to feed. And a lot of those guys were doing trading but through various means to bring in food as much as doing personal hunting. So they would get young guys to hunt for them. They would trade stuff that they had to those young guys, horses, use of their horses. You know, and I've talked before about how they actually leased out stuff. It wasn't like a signed contract, but the lease was, I'm going to let you use my horse and this is what it's going to cost you. And then when you're done, I get my horse back. So that's a lease. That's renting it right there. And, uh, you know, I use a lot of modern words and terminology just so you get it. And there again, I've had people get offended about that, saying stuff like that. But, you know, just say stuff to get to the, to the gist or the heart of it right away. Uh, so that's basically life of the boy and the girl until they get married and then they move on. Uh, but a little bit more on the women. So the, the people that were actually raising the babies generally are, are taking care of the babies. We're just like in Wyoming, the early ranches. A lot of times it was the grandma's and the young girls that were like seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. In other words, the ones that weren't ready or were too old to do, be doing heavy physical labor, they were the ones that, that took care of the babies, fed them, nurtured them, played with them, did all that stuff. So it was the same thing with Indian people. The Indian women that were like 16 to 35, they were working. They were working like all the time doing something, something pertaining to work and keeping their people alive. Um, uh, so that's that. And then another thing really quick on the, the age of the women and the age of the girls as they got married. And this is my, one of my theories. I don't, I've never read this in a book or anything, but I'm pretty sure this is true. So most all the tribes, and you'll read this, there was like a mother-in-law taboo. It's like you were supposed to not directly talk to your mother-in-law. Uh, if she came in the teepee or you vice versa, one of you had to leave. Um a lot of times that was negated too if you went on a war party and brought her back a horse and gave her a horse or gave her a scalp of an enemy. But there's all these, you read it all the time, all the mother-in-law taboos, but there, there's hardly ever anything at all that says why. Well, why is that? What, what's behind the mother-in-law taboo? Here's what's behind it. When the girls are 15 and 16 that are getting married. Their mothers are only like 30, 32, 33, 35 still. If you're a 45-year-old man, which was common to be marrying a girl 15 or 16 or in their 30s, their mothers were still probably pretty attractive to you as well. That's bad. You don't want you don't want the man to be attracted to both the mother and the daughter. That's a bad deal. So that's my theory. And it could be way off, but I tell you what, I'm a man. I know how men are. If the mother's attractive and you're attracted to her daughter, well, then there you go. So without getting too blunt about any of it. So I think that's what the whole mother-in-law taboo is. I could be way wrong, but I don't think I am on that one. So, <laughs> okay, next. I think it's gonna storm here. Um, how did they get their names? Was it predetermined before birth or did they get names after birth or when did they get their names. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so um, names. Uh, first of all, women a lot of times were given a really powerful name. Uh, in movies, it's always something like Golden Butterfly or Yellow Sunshine or you know, you know, Blue Morning or something that sounds feminine and nice and pleasant and all that. But a lot of times, the women were named very powerful names, and they were named after men sometimes. You know, like Takes a Gun Woman or you know, Mini Scouts Woman or you know, whatever. Uh, uh, because they believed that a name was very powerful and they believed that women needed a powerful name to help them get, get through their life. And a lot of times women never changed their name throughout their life. And, um, and sometimes once they got married, they might be known as, you know, so-and-so's woman, so-and-so's wife, uh, but they still had their own name. Okay. So usually when you're born, you were given a name and a lot of times a name giver uh, was brought in and you gifted, paid that person to name your child for you. And it would usually have a spiritual you know, connotation behind it. Um, and this could be like a grandpa. It could be anybody in your family. A lot of the time, sometimes it was just a, re a respected person in your tribe that did this for you. 
and um, and you know they may have been many different reasons for the name that they finally put upon you, but they truly believed they had power. And so as you grew up, especially as a boy, and you became a man or in becoming a man, you may receive another name because of some brave deed or something that happened to you. Um, and you might even have two or three or more names in your life as you change them all. And they would throw away their old name. They didn't have like, you know, all those nine different la- names all tagged onto each other. Uh, women sometimes would change their and have their names changed only if like they fell ill or if they were just had a long series of really bad luck or bad medicine. And they thought there again, since names were powerful, if we throw away her old name and give her a new name, then then that'll really affect her and help her to you know move on in life. Um, oh, here's a really good one first before I move on to something else. So, you know, some names were kind of like a nickname. Um, and those were okay to kind of speak, but no one would generally say their name right to that, that, that person's name right to their face. And they wouldn't ever speak, never say never, never say always, but they wouldn't usually speak um, a person's name after they had passed away. And um, I'd read that in so many different original primary accounts of all the different tribes saying that. And then here's a good one that goes back to looking at videos of modern day indigenous people. So I was watching a video of these South American Indians. These are the ones that's real, you know, South American Indians still with the, you know, the, the whole deal, living and shoot monkeys and parrots and living huts and all that stuff. And the ethnologists, anthropologists that were studying them didn't catch this, but I caught it instantly when these guys were talking. So these two guy, Indian guys were talking to each other and there were subtitles below what they were saying, of course. And they were talking about somebody that had passed away. And, and instead of saying, you know, like Red Sky or whatever the guy's name was, they said, the guy said to the other, so he would know he was talking about, who he was talking about. He said, you know, that guy whose name sounds like our word for kneading bread, whatever, which might have sounded like Red Sky, you know, like, instead of Red Sky. So I got it right then. See, he wasn't going to come out and say Red Sky, but he was going to say this word that sounded like Red Sky so that the guy would know who he was talking about. Because they believed, and this was the thought up here too, by uttering a person's name that's passed away, you risk bringing them out of the spirit world, the next world, heaven, whatever you want to call it, back into this world at least a little bit, which is more or less kind of a ghost. So they're, so they're caught between the spirit world and this, this world we live in where they shouldn't be. They should be in the spirit world. That's where they belong. Once they pass. They belong in heaven, whatever your concept of that is, or whatever a native's concept of that was in the old day. And that varied from tribe to tribe, too, of course. Um, so that's why they never spoke their names aloud in public uh, once they're passed on and just really never said a person's name to himself. You know, they didn't go around using their, their names against each other all the time. Okay? What next? Any more questions? I want to touch, if, if you guys want a few more minutes, I want to touch on crime and punishment within the tribes. Was there crime and what was punishment like in tri- within the tribe? Did you say crime? Yeah, crime and then punishment. Okay, crime and punishment. Okay. Um, uh, well, you know, the warrior societies you hear about, like the dog men or people called dog soldiers and all the other many warrior societies that they had, you know, they really, their function wasn't so much going to war. And some of them didn't go to war in their warrior societies at all. Uh, they went to war, broken up into a war party, but they wouldn't have like the red shields riding together, which is a society and the elkhorn scrapers riding together and the bowstrings riding together and the red shields riding together. You get it because they had no way of recording all the information that was required to be in that society, like all the songs, all the ceremonies, it was all in people's head. And so, and that happened to the Cheyenne once uh, and they lost so much information. And after that, it's like real early, like 1820 something, really early 1830, I can't remember. But um, they learned the lesson, don't go to war as a war society because if they're all killed in a massacre, you've lost all that power. You've lost all the songs, all the ceremonies, all the things that make that society you know, what it is. 
So anyway, the Warrior Societies were usually a combination of police and game wardens more than anything. And they policed the camps, you know, they, you know, and they didn't have to do a lot of that, but they, they settled arguments and stuff like that. You know, you, you hear that, you know, they, did, they didn't steal from each other, like the people in the village didn't steal from each other. And that showed how noble and stuff they were. Well, they were noble and they were honest and cool. But again, the reality of it is, it's just like pick any small town in Wyoming or any other rural area. And you're not going to have many thieves in that town either because you can't steal Bob Jones's favorite hat and be wearing it next week because everybody knows that's Bob's hat. And he miss, he's been missing it for a week. And you've got it on. So Indian people were the same. You couldn't take nothing from them in a village but not everybody know that you had stolen that item from that person. So, um, uh, so you know, adultery, that could be punished, but that was usually handled by the families. Um, unfortunately, since it was a really male dominated society amongst the plains, Eastern woodlands are different. And that's because they were agriculturalists versus hunter gatherers. I can go into that later if you want. Um, the women, you know, usually received a much more brutal punishment than the men. A man could usually just pay his way off. He just pay the husband, like, hair, here's a horse, a couple of blankets, a gun. Sorry, man, I won't do it again. And that was the end of it. But, you know, the women, and in some tribes, you know, like the Blackfeet, they cut their nose, the tip of their nose off, all the cartilage part. Um, and that was like an extreme. That didn't happen all the time. But it happened, you know. Was, there's even women photographs, old photos of women that had had that done to them. Um, uh, murder, that was handled differently amongst tribes, too. Uh, like I said, I went to Cheyenne. Uh, there was no real punishment for it other than banishment. And they would banish you from the tribe for four years, which to an Indian, that was really a bad thing because being a very social group and very tight knit and knowing that survival meant being with your people, um, that was a really bad thing. And they would follow the tribe and kind of stay within you know, sight of them, but they couldn't come into the tribe and be a part of them. And then after the end of the, that four year period, uh, they could be come back into the tribe, but they were never they were shunned from that point on. If they had murdered a tribal member, and they could never become a member of a war party again or a warrior society again, they could never do any of the social stuff again. Uh, so that was all big, big punishment. A lot of tribes murder, which meant you murdered again someone within your own tribe, your own people, was settled by the families as well, and the families would just get all their men that they could together, every brother, uncle, son, grandpa. And they would just find the murderer and just kill him, kill it pretty much straight up. And it was straight, it was done with, it was over with, that was the end of the story. When the warrior societies had to come in and take, take control and punish someone, they were just like law enforcement anywhere. You had to be above the, the force that you were meeting. In other words, you're a criminal and you do something wrong, one policeman generally isn't gonna come after you. We're gonna send four, five, 10, whatever it's gonna take, because that's how you get the job done the least risk to the enforcers, see? So they knew if somebody does something wrong, they're gonna send 20, 30 guys over there and lay down the law. And about the worst thing you could do, because they were very socialistic, everything was about the tribe and not the individual. And you could be free and all that and have an individual all you wanted. But as an individual, you couldn't do anything to hurt the tribe. The tribe had to live, live forever and go on and on and on. But, you know, humans die, so they understood that effect. So anything that hurt the tribe was totally wrong. And the worst thing you could do was hunt buffalo without permission, because buffalo was the primary food source, of course. You could hunt deer, elk, antelope, and they killed every Bambi, every tiny baby, every everything they could kill, they killed, because it was an easy kill, and they wanted that easy kill stuff. They didn't want to risk their life doing it. And like I say, they never looked at the baby deer and thought, oh, beautiful little baby, We'll let it propagate the species, grow up, breed, all that, have little babies and stuff. They're like, oh, it's a gift from God. It's a gift from the creator and a gift from that animal itself that's given itself to me right now so I can go feed my babies. I can feed my grandma, my children, and all that, and myself. So, uh, but, and they hunted any time of the year. There was no taboos on any of it generally. But buffalo, being the number one animal that supplied everything for everybody, you just couldn't hunt without permission of these warrior societies. And, and every season, like at the beginning of the year, spring, um, they would, the, the, the leaders, the, the old men chiefs, the social chiefs, the civil chiefs, they were usually like war chiefs 
and they're like civil chiefs. War chiefs for young guys, civil chiefs for the old guys. Uh, the old GIs, they decided things like this and where to move camp, where there's water, where there's grass and all that. And they would appoint one of these societies to be like basically the camp police. And they're the ones that policed the camp and did all that stuff. And then they would appoint another one that was basically the hunt police or the game wardens. And you know, if you were out with your buddies and you fought, you know, five head of buffalo, you kill all that, you kill them, no problem. But you know, if you found you know 800 or 10,000 head of buffalo, <clears throat> excuse me, no way could you hit them without going back, reporting what you had seen, where they were, how many there were, and telling those war those hunt police, the game wardens about it. And then the leader of that society that had been appointed to do that that year, he was the one that organized the hunt. And he was the one that took all the hunters out there at the same time. And then his men, the, his game wardens, his police would form a physical barrier between the herd, the buffalo, once they approached them and the buffalo didn't know where they were yet. You know, they were down one from them, of course. Um, the buffalo, like most all game, they smell you, they're gone. And, you know, Indian stunk to an, to an animal just like a white man would stink to an animal if you spent your whole life around smoke, around animal byproducts, you know, around horses, around dogs, all that stuff. So it's not an insult to say Indians had a bad smell to an animal. Uh, and animals hated Indians and were they capable of, uh, of hate. They definitely were afraid of Indians. They didn't like Indians because they knew Indians killed them and ate them. But they didn't like, they, that's one of the things they don't like. So, uh, but they would form a barrier between the, the herd and the, and the men and on the leaders go, it's like opening of the gates at a race, a horse race. And all those men would go out and then they'd all have an equal, an equal shot at, uh, you know, going after the herd. So back to punishment. If you had done that, you had made this huge infraction of, of scaring off uh, 800 head of buffalo or whatever you, yeah, you got two of them, but you also, you know, were detrimental to the whole rest of your little band of people that were with you. So they would generally come to you and, you know, and this varied, but, you know, <clears throat> very common misdemeanor type punishment is uh, they would break all your weapons. They'd take your bows and arrows right in front of you and all your family and relatives and everyone else. They'd break your bows, they'd break your arrows. And they hoped that the public shame of that, so there was a lot of peer pressure, <coughs> excuse me, from the tribe and your family to do the right thing, of course. Um, if you... You know, you're a good criminal or whatever. And you said, I was wrong. I'll never do that again. I, I definitely take my punishment. I shouldn't have done that. They'd replace your bows and arrows. They'd, the ones that they had broken, they'd give you one new one. And that was their way of saying, okay, you were cool again. If you're, you know, if you talk back, if you're a smart aleck or whatever, just like today with law enforcement, well, they're probably not going to respond to that very well either. And so, um, the next thing they, they might do at that point is um, they might start tearing up your woman's stuff, which was the teepee. So they might surround your teepee and they just take their knives and stick them between the poles and just cut right down, shred your teepee, like make fringe, you know, out of like flaps out of your teepee. And of course, with a lot of work, you'd sew it back together. But symbolically, they were sending a strong message. And now your woman is on, now your woman is like, you better, you know, do the right thing because they're going to tear up all of our stuff. Yeah, jerk. So, so if you, again, if you're like, okay, okay, I you broke my weapons and I was a jerk and, and now you're tearing up my TP and uh, I'm not going to be a jerk anymore. I, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Again, they'd replace everything as much as possible. Um, but if you bump it up a notch, just like law enforcement always today, still, they're going to bump it up a notch too. So if you start getting a, you know, you know, the obstinate with them and, and, and all that and, and being a real, you know, <laughs> jerk about it. Um, the next thing they're going to do is they're going to start killing your dogs and they're going to bring in your horses and they're going to kill all your horses right in front of you. Now blood has been shed and that's the strong message. You're next, okay? If you don't take this punishment, we're going to kill you right here on the spot. No judge, no trial, no jury whatsoever. I'm the man in command at this point. And I have the authority to take your life if I want to. And everybody knew that. And that's the way they didn't take it. And they take it to a whole bunch of old chiefs. They heard everybody's point of view. It was decided then on the spot, right then and there. Okay? And there was one little caveat that went with that was um, the man that was doing the punishing, like the leader of that society or group or that particular group of men right there, whoever the leader was, um, he had to have a higher war honors 
you know, than the guy being punished. Um, otherwise, you couldn't punish him. But again, Mike in almost all societies, a man that spent his whole life doing the right thing, uh, you know, where he's got a lot of war honors and a lot of social status, he's probably not going to be doing stupid stuff. He's probably not going to go out and steal stuff or, or, you know, hunt buffalo without permission. So, you know, you could use that caveat, but it, it probably didn't come into play all that often because of that fact. What else? All right. Uh, did we have any more questions? I think we're going to wrap it up here, Michael. Okay, thanks for, well. Um, thanks for sticking with us. Yeah, because I have like just 30 seconds. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't make it to Pine now. Um, there's a whole series of events that happened, including the virus whole thing. And uh, I mean, if I could have been there, I would have. I mean, Clint knows, Don knows, we went back and forth on this a lot. Um, you know, I've said it in a couple of those videos, maybe some of you watched, and I say it everywhere I go. I don't care what other place, venue I talk at, if I hurt their feelings or not. If people ask me, or sometimes I just bring it up without any doubt at all, Pinedale is my favorite place to talk. And you'll never hear me say that about any other place, even though I enjoy talking all the places I go to. But in Pinedale, you know, there's, there's so many local people, there's so many ranch type people that come to listen to me um, and share with me. And, you know, when I start talking about horses, they know, they get it. They know, they hear me. When I start talking about hunting and all the different game and, and how, you know, stock animals and, and just how hard it was to live back then and even today to live in like Wyoming and Montana, that's, that's a lot different than work living in some city back east or down south. And that's not anything against the people that live in those places. But you all, you're, you, all know, you know what I'm talking about. It's a, it's a harder lifestyle. And so um, everybody's always been extremely nice to me there, very accepting of me there. And, um, I, you know, and the Museum of the Mountain Man and BOCES program and you know, Gail Kennison, all the people that have brought me in. This has always been a super great experience for me. And uh, there's nothing like feeling welcome wherever you go for whoever you are. So I appreciate it very much. And uh, remember everything I said that you can counterdict it with, every, with a million different things. My POV, uh, I'll be there next year uh, if I'm still kicking and I hope we all are. And uh, I'll do everything I can to be there every single year I can. And I <clears throat> care for you all very much. And thanks for having me. Oh, thank you, Michael. We very much appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. <laughs>